Gledajte Balkan u Evropa. Ja sam Borjen Jovanovski. A ja sam Ivana Dragičević. Što je pošlo krivo? Izbjeglička kriza pokazala je čini se sve napukline Evrope. Puca na periferiji, puca na granicama, puca u srcu kontinenta. Schengen kao temelj slobode kretanja temeljne vrijednosti Evrope pred izazovom je rasklimati se ili zazidati bedeme oko sebe. Dok ljudi uočaju gaze po evropskom blatu, bombe padaju na Siriju, surove zle borce tzv. islamske države kao da je svijet na tren zaboravio, a tisuće mladih ljudi u Afganistanu vadi putovnice bježeći pred totalnom bespertivnošću. A aktualnite slučivanja vo Evropa seriozno gina grizuvat vrednostite na koji se sozdade Evropska tunija. Solidarnost i slobodata na dviženje to. Xenofobijata i ekstremnata desnica se ovo podem kako reakcija na branot begalci. Evropa se ograduva s od zidovi, a vnatre vo nea se procesi tendenciji na dezintegracija. Katalonciite saka da se odce pa toč Panija, a Velika Britanija se sprema za referendum za napuštanje na Evropska tunija. Se ova se temi koji gi preokupirajat, svetskite medijalne i medijumite u Evropa se razbira. A da tako kažemo, kvo vadi se Evropa, where does Europe Where is Europe going tonight? We are talking about our distinguished, uh, distinguished guests, correspondents from Brussels. Uh, Tom Natal, uh, the economist, correspondent uh, and author of the praised Charlemagne column. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Uh, Leo Sandrovitz, uh, correspondent for The Independent from Brussels. Welcome. And join us uh, Knut Priest, uh, the correspondent from uh, uh, Funke Media Group from That's Germany, right. Augustin Pavokaj, uh, Poznata Balkanu, Dopisnik Jutarnjeg Lista. Welcome. So, Borjan, at the beginning, uh, we will see uh, uh, the situation on the borders between Slovenia and Croatia and Croatia and Serbia for the last couple of days is uh, very harsh. So let's see some of the pictures from these borders and a couple of sentences from ministers of interior of a couple of European countries which could maybe help us start this debate today. Let's watch it. <laughs> Ein wichtiger Punkt, der heute wird der bessere Schutz der Außengrenzen der Europäischen Union sein. Ein Europa ohne gesicherte Außengrenzen wird bald ein Europa voller interner Grenzkontrollen sein. Das wollen wir nicht. Deswegen muss der Schutz der Außengrenzen verbessert werden. Ich glaube, dass Schengen, der Kontrolle der Frontiere extérieure, die Migration in general und auch die Retour sind ein Paket. We need to ensure that we break the link between people making a dangerous journey to Europe and being able to stay in Europe. That's why the UK has always argued that we should be sending economic migrants back to their countries of origin. It's why we need to crack down on those who are abusing our asylum system. The UK has a good record in this area, but on returns we need to see Europe upping its game. So, dear colleague, looks like very messy. What's the future of, let's say, the free movement? Shall we continue uh, to construct the, the walls around Europe, or shall we protect one of the basic, uh, fundamental value of European Union as a freedom of movement? Tom, please. It's true that the free movement of people through Europe um, has been threatened and in many cases hindered as a result of this crisis. Um, we've seen controls go up between certain countries, including countries within the Schengen area, the, the passport free area that covers most of the European Union. Um, and uh, Hungary, of course, has erected uh, fences on its border, first with Serbia, now with Croatia. But what we see with the migrant flows is that it's rather like water. You know, it reaches a barrier and then it finds a quicker 
its way around the barrier. So the fence goes up between Hungary and Serbia, people move into Croatia and mm -hmm. then to Hungary. The fence goes up between Hungary and Croatia, then move into Slovenia and so forth. Now, what a lot of people have started to argue in Brussels is that the integrity of the Schengen zone can only be protected, can only be safeguarded if there is proper security of the external border, the European Union's external border. Now, primarily, that means the Greek border with Turkey. That's very difficult. That's a maritime border. There's lots of islands. There's a very long coastline. It's difficult to protect. It does also mean, as Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, regularly points out, Hungary's border, which is a European Union external border as well. So at the moment, that's where the debate is. Let's see if we can step up the, the security of the European Union's external border in order to safeguard the future of the Schengen zone, because freedom of movement within that Schengen zone is one of the aspects of the European Union that its citizens thrive above all. Knut, as we know, uh, in Germany it was not popular at all to, to speak about integration of Turkey in the European Union. Uh, Madame Merkel was against uh, this integration. Suddenly we see Madame Merkel like very much in favor of uh, Turkey uh, rapprochement towards the European Union. So what, what's your comment? Well, I think it's a question of priorities. She's never been uh, a big fan of uh, Turkey's accession to the European Union, that's true. But I don't think she's absolutely opposed to the idea. Um, let's remember that uh, there is a common, a joint position of all EU member states to hold those negotiations about accession to which she, as the German Chancellor, has subscribed. So there is a formal obligation to continue with the process. I think uh, her priorities as they stand right now, it's the most difficult period of her chancellery, um, uh, her priorities are now let's get uh, uh, something done on this uh, refugees crisis first. If it means uh, um, pussyfooting a little bit with Mr. Erdogan. Um, a visa that, liberalization, postponing the criticism. Yeah, give it, giving him something for the election. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think she's prepared to do it. And as far as the German general public is concerned, it's split. I think the overwhelming. Uh, feeling would be some sort of uh, skepticism, yes, but again, um, those who are fundamentally opposed to the whole idea would constitute a minority. And there has been there has been a German a German government in the past which uh, made sure that this uh, these negotiations about accession uh, started in the first place. So it's it's not the whole of Germany is completely opposed to the idea. My question goes to all. When we see the decision and the policies made by the European commissions and then all the fuss in the European Council and the member states behaving like, you know, singular entities inside of European Union, uh, can we basically expect things to <clears throat> calm down in a way and to be structured after the winter, maybe? or? Uh, you know, can we expect completely chaos and really serious repercussions for Europe inside itself after this? Or during this, whatever, it's open to everyone. Well, obviously we're in an uncharted territory. We've never had a crisis quite like this, quite this large in this sort of domain. So to try and foresee whether we're gonna, some sort of structure, some sort of process mm -hmm. is gonna emerge, it's very, very difficult. I mean, we're talking about millions of people potentially going on the march mm -hmm. through, um, through Europe to different places and seeing walls being, uh, being erected and seeing all sorts of new policies and uh, de facto policies uh, as well um, coming, uh, emerging from different member states. It's very difficult to foresee where this is gonna go, what, what's gonna be the end point. For example, we look at, we look at the, when we look at the potential deal with Turkey, it's about dealing with um, getting them to help uh, keep two million Syrians in their country. Is that really going to work? The assumption is that, uh, that if we play ball with Turkey, we give them uh, what they want on visas and entry into the EU, then they'll actually keep them on their shores. Is that really going to work? I'm a bit skeptical about that. I, I think that if the Syrians really want to go to Europe, the rest of Europe, then whatever the Turks do is not going to stop them. Someone mentioned Viktor Orban. Uh, he 
kinds of repeat all the time that you know it's the end of the liberal so-called liberal Europe uh, as we know it uh, so is it because I, I see a lot of you know hardcore right wing people around Europe clapping to, to that idea well uh, I mean I don't think that it's the end of liberal Europe we were just discussing before that the ideologic divide doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. you have uh, social democrat leaders from Eastern Europe who speaking about refugee like crisis and, they yeah. sound like extreme right from Western Europe so uh, it's more I would say northwest divide uh, versus southeast and uh, we have to admit that not every country is affected the same way with this crisis that's why when you have 28 some countries insist on uh, some principles other insist uh, on uh, solution of the immediate problem and here european commission uh, couldn't play bigger role because whenever you ask something about the immediate problem they for example uh, what can you do to help slovenia today they say that we have few million in a, a, a financial framework 2014 2020 so uh, then you have majority uh, many uh, commissioners speaking about uh, uh, re uh, relocation of 19 refugees from italy to sweden uh, showing that on tv the things are starting and uh, at the same day you have 5000 people crossing from uh, Serbia into Croatia so uh, in this situation I expect that the wave will slow down uh, it will be in uh, smaller numbers but it will not stop and I agree that uh, uh, it's difficult to guess how the deal with Turkey will work because let's be honest uh, EU maybe it's not in the best position to deliver even if it promises something to Turkey uh, I can imagine that if Turkey managed to stop refugees passing from uh, Turkey to Greece uh, and Cyprus or somebody else stop a single chapter in the negotiations then Turks can change their behavior as well at any time so um, I'm skeptical about this uh, deal in the uh, in the uh, short term but do you see this let's call it axis of Germany and Turkey as a key axis for kind of trying to to calm things down concerning the situation from war in Syria to the refugees issue. Should the other is going to join the I mean, I whole mean, process I mean, or it's so up to the Turkey and, uh, and Germany to now to resolve the crisis? If, if, if the Germans, I mean, the, the Chancellor went very far going mm -hmm. uh, to, to Istanbul uh, single-handedly this time, um, but I think the Germans can't afford to overstretch uh, in, in the axis direction. Mm -hmm. if, if they were trying to play it that way, it would backfire. What is true is that, um, first of all, Germany is, in terms of sheer numbers, is the most affected country and, for the time being, the most interested to, to do something about it. So that's, that's the starting point. Uh, second, um, the, the position of Germany vis-à-vis Turkey's EU uh, future is, is essential and crucial. Yes, that's true. But um, at the same time, uh, German reservations vis-à-vis -vis, uh, 80 million or so Muslim uh, citizens joining the EU have been strong in the past. Uh, German criticism of Mr. Erdogan has been very strong in the past, and you can't just uh, uh, flush it down the drain uh, like that. So it, it has to be played very cautiously also on the German side. Just, just a small digression, if you're allowed. How the public opinion in Germany received the, the, the video from uh, Istanbul and the, from the uh, oriental dec decorated cabinet of Mr. Erdogan? These two golden Maybe. chairs and you know, the king and the queen sitting. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at Buckingham Palace with, uh, you know, 99% admiration and 1% um, we're flabbergasted. Uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, it's the other way around, presumably. Yeah. So, so uh, it's, it's uh, how, how, can a, how can a modern leader build something like this? Huh? Yeah. Um, it's it's astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is for the modern yeah. Europe kind of the concept of militarized border? Let's say it because we can talk about this concept or control. But what is control of outer uh, borders in this situation? Is this kind of uh, horrible to contemplate in a way of you know fundamental values of Europe of today? So. 
I mean, when Hungary started putting fences up, that was certainly the feeling from a lot of quarters. Europe in 2015, and we're putting walls up rather than tearing them down. There was a lot of horror initially. But at the same time, there is this feeling that I was describing earlier that what we have to do before we can do anything else, before we have any grand visionary plans like resettling millions of refugees from the region or rewriting Europe's asylum rules, is to protect the border. Now, um, the funny thing about Mr. Orban's fence is that although a lot of the rhetoric that we've heard from the Hungarian Prime Minister has been um, distasteful, even shocking to some European ears when he talks about preserving the Christian character of Europe. He presents himself as in the vanguard of, of defending European civilization against invading Muslim hordes. Obviously, words like that don't sit very well on European ears, at least in this place. But when it comes to the particular question of protecting the external frontier, a lot of people who talk to in this town, at least sotto voce, when they're speaking quietly, they will say, well, actually, we fully understand why he did that. And as, as Viktor Orban never misses a chance to point out, he is doing exactly what the rules say he should be doing in protecting that border. And so a lot of people here, when they say, if we want to protect Schengen, if we want to do more for refugees, then we have to take control of the border first, there is at least a quiet understanding that Viktor Orban, um, by taking matters into his own hand, may be doing what the rules are suggesting that he should be doing. Apropos Mr Orban, do you think that there is any mechanism within the European Union to spread this kind of tendencies within Europe, an uh, authoritarian one, and let's say anti-European tendencies? Um, about a decade ago, mm -hmm. there was a politician who emerged in, in Austria, yeah. Haida, yeah. and uh, he eventually, his party eventually uh, came into coalition with the, uh, the ruling governing party. And it prompted a strong reaction from the rest of the EU, who effectively tried to blackball Austria and exclude it from certain... certain Austria in one moment was isolated within yeah, the European exactly. Council, yeah. The Troika coming in and out, yeah. It did not work. It, it, it just it em emboldened the, uh, the, the Austrians. They felt that yeah. the, the Austrian voters felt that they were being unfairly treated. It didn't do anything to harm the electoral prospects of Jörg Haider and his party. So I think they may... I hope they've learned the lesson that sort of... That sort of approach does not work. When it doesn't killing. look that they learned the lessons, indeed. I mean, <laughs> it's, but uh, I mean, you always hear in Europe that Europe learns the lessons. They never do mistakes, but they learn <laughs> lessons. Uh, speaking about the walls and fences that uh, Hungary is building, the uh, bizarre thing is that uh, it is within Europe. So if the refugees come to the Hungarian border, that means that for, for days they have been in European continent also in European Union, because Hungary has very short uh, external EU border, that one with Serbia. The, the biggest border is with uh, Romania and, and Croatia as well. Croatia has the longest uh, external EU border with in Bosnia European and Union and, and with Serbia. But again, uh, people from Bosnia and from Serbia can enter European Union without visas. So uh, in the long term, I don't see any uh, reason to have walls and fences because that be, uh, against whom they are uh, protecting Europe. And which Europe? Because Western Balkans is Europe as well. It's not European Union uh, uh, yet. Uh, it will not be maybe in the near future, but it is Europe. Uh, then uh, the, uh, another problem with, uh, with the, uh, Orban and fences is that, uh, uh, yes, he's, everybody is supposed to protect external borders of Schengen or uh, external borders of European Union, but uh, uh, there is no limit uh, set uh, where, uh, until w where they can go in doing that. So uh, European Commission, apart from saying that the time of the walls is over, uh, couldn't do anything, uh, not even criticize uh, directly Orban about that. Mm -hmm. I would do, uh, yes. Can I do a little bit of labeling now? Because uh, how do you think that the, 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 the media scene, because you're all representatives of the media, colleagues are uh, kind of behaving in, in this uh, current crisis? And because we have a German journalist here, a journalist from the region of Southeast Europe, and I can say, basically, if we do with the stereotypes, a media which is considered like the leftist one, the independent, and one, you know, serious conservative opinion maker as the economist. So how do you uh, judge, you know, the role of the media in this situation? 
There has been... Well, first of all, I think I've, I've got to take you up on that. Okay, uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> please do. I was asking myself. Yeah. Please do. When, on, no, I was joking. On, was on matters, I mean, on, on, not, not to talk too much about ourselves, which you don't yeah. like doing, but on matters of migration, we've always been mm -hmm. very what you might consider liberal. Um, now, I, think, well, I mean, one of the issues, at least in the English-speaking media um, surrounding this whole debate, is one of terminology, um, and specifically this question of what do we describe the people who are coming to Europe, Europe as? Are they migrants? or are they refugees? Now, for some people, um, this is a very emotional debate, that the notion is if you call people migrants and you're dehumanizing them, you're suggesting that they're moving for non-humanitarian reasons and you are sort of <coughs> preparing the ground for a debate that will see them all be sent back. Um, now, I, I think that that's a problematic position um, because, I mean, you can analyze the flows of people coming in. And let's remember that there are two major routes into Europe. The one we hear so much about these days, for good reason, is Turkey, Greece, up through the Balkans to Germany. But we also have very large numbers of people coming from Africa to Libya, through the Mediterranean and to Italy, and then north from there. Um, and these migrant flows are fairly different. Um, the flows coming in via Turkey, I think the majority, I think that a, a small majority of people are Syrians who are almost all bona fide refugees. A lot of people from Iraq. But then there are also people from further afield, Afghanistan, further east, Pakistan, so Myanmar, Bangladesh, also, yeah. all these sorts of people who probably don't meet the, um, the legal definition of refugee. If you look at the people coming from Africa, again, these are mixed flows. People coming from Eritrea, almost all of them obtain humanita humanitarian protection in Europe. Lots of people from countries in, for example, West Africa, Nigeria, Senegal don't so much. So this is a very long way of saying that these are mixed, complicated flows. The motives of even a single individual may be mixed. They may be partly economic, partly humanitarian. So when it comes to a question of terminology, absolutely, we do need to be very careful. But the people who uh, defend a hard line and say that um, ensuring that we maintain a distinction between economic migrants and, um, and a legitimate asylum seekers, people who can obtain refugee status, there is an important point there, and it's one to bear in mind as we think about what the policy responses are going to be. Okay, how, 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 Germany, yeah, how the media in Germany hand, handle with the, this race of far, far right in, in Germany? Well, I mean, there is a, a very interesting dynamics going on as far as Germany is concerned. We came out of also in the, uh, in the media image. Uh, that was reflected uh, in, 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 in uh, newspapers and broadcasting in Germany. We came out of this summer as, as, the, as Europe's bad guy. I mean, the way uh, the Greek crisis uh, was resolved left uh, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble and, and uh, to a lesser degree Angela Merkel uh, with, with uh, very ugly faces as far as the perception elsewhere was concerned. So the Germans, when Angela Merkel gave her famous wir schaffen das, we will cope, we will manage yes. promise. Uh, and and um, we, we noticed the um, uh, favorable reaction response in, in most other quarters of the European Union. Germans were very proud of themselves. This was reflected in the media as well. But we have, as, as all uh, EU member states, we have a strong minority, right-wing, populist, uh, even racist minority, absolutely. It fell silent for a few weeks. But now, as um, the, the, uh, the question, and how are we going to cope, becomes ever more prominent, this uh, voice is much uh, louder heard again. And uh, as far as the media are concerned, it, it's, it's split down the middle as far as, as are the politicians or the population itself. In this messy circumstances, may I ask you, what, what's about the, the enlargement? The uh, progress report was postponed <coughs> because of the Turkey, I mean, in order to make some concession to Erdogan before the election. So could we, could we, could we talk even about the enlargement having in mind this situation in, in well, I mean, Europe? Uh, I, uh, I follow enlargement for 18 years, so we'll say uh, we'll answer that. But just wanted to mention mm -hmm. something about the Western Balkan media and refugee crisis, mm -hmm. because at least here we have something positive to say that the media and the society as a whole was very positive towards uh, uh, refugees, uh, having sympathy for them because the, because they have experience of being refugees themselves and seeing refugees during the war and after the war. Uh, it would be good if if uh, they are nice to each other uh, in the way that they were nice to refugees. So we, we, we didn't see any xenophobic rhetoric in the media uh, during
during the refugee crisis. We've seen it between uh, Serbian media yeah. towards uh, Croatians or Albanians. We saw insults uh, being exchanged even by politicians, but not about refugees. And here, uh, the Western Balkan countries are different from the rest of Eastern Europe, I would say. And uh, uh, this is because of uh, good experience. Coming back to enlargement, exactly the refugee crisis and the Greek crisis made uh, uh, enlargement uh, as something which is not seen as a priority anymore in uh, uh, European but can Union. can these countries you... now, I'm sorry to interrupt you, bargain in a way with the EU, which Turkey kind of did because it's, you know, necessary no, the, to solve the, this the problem? The Western Balkan countries have nothing to bargain with mm -hmm. because the refugees are just passing there. They cannot stop. I mean, uh, and they are far from... Uh, don't forget that Turkey opened accession negotiations the same day that Croatia did, even half an hour earlier. And they managed to open only 14 chapters and closed only one. And Croatia is a member already almost three years. Three years. So uh, uh, Turkey has something to bargain with. It hosts more than two million refugees. Then uh, Turkey has a right to be uh, f uh, to feel neglected and uh, in a way not treated uh, uh, in a uh, uh, proper way as a candidate country, while the Western Balkan countries have no reason to believe <coughs> that they could move faster because they are. Yeah, but we are, honest, we are, are kind not... of sorry. We are risking yeah. political instability. We have, you know, case with Macedonia, which is uh, not Macedonia so good. Is we the have... only, uh, Macedonia is the only country that fulfills. Uh, uh, the uh, criteria to open negotiations. Commission has confirmed this many times. But the situation but, uh, on the ground is... Uh, uh, what do you expect? What, what the European is, Commission is going to, to say in, in, the, in the new strategy of enlargement, which is going to be published in uh, early November? I mean, well, are they going to say, yes, we go further or let's stop because, you know, now it's, we are the in The Commission a, will inevitably try and do something which is more European than... Um, the will of the uh, the European people or the governments there. So we'll try and find joint joint responses uh, in dealing with relocation and resettlement. And uh, at the same time, they they recognise that you've got to balance this sort of humanitarian uh, response, this uh, solidarity with with the refugees and the migrants, with a uh, a tougher approach when it comes to looking after the borders. So, uh, so as Tom mentioned, the idea of, of strengthening uh, the external borders, uh, improving the processing um, and uh, improving the return system. So it's, it's going to be, they're, they're going to be trying to find, like, like I suppose most uh, of the leaders in Europe, a balance between, between the, uh, the, the, uh, the tough and the, uh, and the more gentle approaches. Mm. Tom? The same question about the perspective on enlargement. On well, enlargement, I mean, it's hard to say. As you said, the um, the progress reports have been postponed almost certainly until after the Turkish election on November the first. Um, now we hear rumours that the um, that particular report contains unusually tough language, given the the democratic backsliding in Turkey um, in the last uh, the, over the last year. Um, what might it mean for the countries of the Balkans? Hard to say. Um, I was struck. I was in Belgrade a few weeks ago just for the day, um, and I was told by someone I interviewed there that uh, the night before there had been a big demonstration in the main square of the city. And I thought, oh, well, that's a shame. There's an, an anti-immigrant demonstration in a, in a place that no one wants to stay in. And I thought, no, 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 this was a pro-immigrant demonstration. And I was struck, because there's not very many countries in Europe that are holding pro-migrant demonstrations at the moment. Um, I suppose that, I mean, I entirely agree that the, um, the Balkan countries do not have bargaining chips in a, in a discussion with Brussels in the way that Turkey does, because they are not countries of origin. Um, but I suppose one possible dynamic that could play itself out here is to the extent that the, um, the countries that are on the, the Western Balkan route, I suppose in particular Macedonia and Serbia that are candidate countries, to the extent that they are considered to be cooperating with European policy, um, to, be, uh, to be helpful rather than intransigent, that can only bode well for the future of their, um, of their discussions with the, with the Commission on enlargement. But of course, um, enlarge, the enlargement procedure involves technical discussions and chapters being opened and so forth. Um, but <clears throat> may, this is an opportunity to 
acquire some political goodwill, and I assume that that's an opportunity that those governments will want to Look, you know, Macedonia, do you think that, having in mind that Europe somehow needs Macedonia as a transit country right now, do you think that in this progress report, European Commission is just going to close the eyes in front of the some obvious authoritarian tendency within the country? No, I think uh, as far as uh, enlargement um, re uh, is concerned and progress reports, this is not going to change a lot. I mean, the, the current uh, refugee crisis. Uh, and at, at, at least not as far as uh, um, the texts are concerned that are being written by the uh, commission uh, experts in that regard. It, it, it'll stay the same. I think what might change a little bit is, <clears throat> so to speak, a negative bargaining position of the Western Balkan countries. The, the long neglect, for instance, of the, the situation in Greece has backfired uh, in a hard way now. And some, I believe, Chancellor Merkel including, uh, do realize that um, the Western Balkans need a little more attention than they have gotten over the last five years or so. Will it bring in uh, Macedonia uh, on a shortcut way? No, I don't believe it will. Mm -hmm. And will it, will it soften the uh, criticism of authoritarian tendencies in the, in the Skopje government? No, it won't. We have five more minutes. But just I just to, okay, wanted just to say so. what we expect from enlargement package. So, a uh, minimum uh, that European Union can use to say that process is continuing. That means that uh, next week they will sign a stabilization association agreement with Kosovo. Mm -hmm. They already proposed to open the first chapter with Serbia. If, uh, if uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, 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 fulfill the criteria for the reforms, they can apply for membership. Macedonia has a uh, candidate status. They can repeat recommendation again. And with this, they can say, you see that enlargement is ongoing, so we are not stopping. Mm -hmm. This to encourage uh, the Western Balkan countries, but also to tell to the public opinion in Western Europe that we are not going uh, with enlargement as fast as you are afraid. So, uh, something in between. Just uh, two, must, two short must. rounds. How can Europe position itself towards war in Syria as a soft power or do something with other international players at this point of time? And the second one, like to next challenges we're expecting situation in spain elections december brexit debate britain situation just you know who wants to answer what we'll go for a short round economies about the brexit yeah it, it's not so conservative huh? five seconds well, the, uh, liberal liberal sorry my fault <laughs> this place has a nice habit of sequencing its crises one after another so we had the um, the greek crisis a few months ago which um it, well it's it, it may not have been resolved but it's certainly quietened down for now um, that gave way to the current situation with refugees um, in the run-up to the December European Council just before Christmas, this is when we are supposed to have um, the first proper round of political negotiations between the British government and its, um, and the, its 27 member states. So we can expect to hear a lot more of that in the future. Um, I've always been fairly optimistic on the Britain question in that I would be very, very surprised to see um, British voters elect to leave the European Union. That said, um, this early phase of the discussions doesn't seem to have been orchestrated particularly cleverly. Um, in the last couple of weeks, the, 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 the clamour, both from um, institutions here in Brussels and from some other governments, um, has been, well, we've really come to the end of the road of this phase in talks with Britain. We now need to know what your demands are. And um, at the recent European Council, David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, uh, agreed to send um, a letter to Donald Tusk, the President of the European Council, outlining, outlining those demands by early November. That'll be the next chapter in this discussion. We hope that this whole process will be managed rather more um, uh, carefully than what we've seen with both Greece and with the refugees issue. I'm optimistic on that front, but we'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. Syria war, Spanish challenge. I don't think, I don't think the, uh, the European Union will be in a position to make a big difference there. Um, I mean, um, they are simply, they simply haven't got the instruments uh, to do so as yet, or they just have it on paper. The common uh, security and foreign policy is, is, is uh, more a headline than a, than a reality as far as that is concerned. Um, if they can't make up uh, their minds about uh, the military 
um, tool uh, of the European Union, they won't, uh, they will always uh, play second fiddle as far as uh, strategic influence uh, is concerned. They can certainly do more in terms of uh, spending money where it is badly needed. It's a, it's a crying shame and a stupidity of some proportion that they have uh, let the situation escalate by sheer uh, uh, um, need of means that are not made available in, in the camps around Syria. So they can do something there, but it, it's going to be, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, the Palestinian question as far as Europe is concerned. They, they simply don't have the muscle to, to change things. So Even we'll have to talk, to we'll talk about yeah. Spain then in December. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. We had just half an hour. Poštovani gledatelji, bio ova prva emisija Balkan u Evropi sa dopisnicima inozemnih i medija iz regije koji su ovdje u Briselu. Hvala vam što ste bili s nama. Doviđenja. Doviđenja. Thank you.